All right. So we're in a series called Who, Who Am I? Uh, no, it's called Who Am I? And we just launched our life group. So we're in week two of our life groups. It's not too late to get in. If you're just showing up and you're like, life group, I want to be involved in that. Like Bible study, small group, other words you may have heard. Smaller groups of people getting together to talk about life. And we're going through this book called Who Am I? We're taking six weeks to do it. And we're also matching the series with that. Uh, so today we're in uh, chapter se- We're starting chapter seven of the book. Uh, so if you guys have read ahead a little bit, cheaters, <laughs> uh, then you'll be you'll be tracking. Or if you haven't read, then you'll be caught up. So that on when you go to your group this week, you can talk about it. Uh, but the whole premise is that there are things that happen in life sometimes where we we're pretty confident about who we are, who we're designed to be, where we fit in life. Maybe if you, like, stop to try and answer that question, not really, but you feel okay enough in life, secure enough that you can go through, but then something happens. Uh, Sometimes, it could be anything, but just one thing deviates from the plan, and all of a sudden, we find ourselves questioning, well, I thought I knew who I was, but this doesn't make sense, or I thought I knew where I was going, but now I'm confused, Uh, and so this book is really great because it takes us through when those things happen, who are you, because really our anchor is in Christ, so no matter what happens, there's an anchor that we can come back to, and then from that point, we we pivot and we redirect our life, so if you're not involved in a group yet, it's not too late. You can find information about that and jump right in with us. We'd love to have you do that. And today we're talking about who am I when I feel alone? Who am I when I feel alone? You guys are so excited. (laughs) Let's talk about loneliness. (laughs) Uh, No, in the last two weeks we've talked about uh, comparison and the other one, um, measuring up. So measuring up and comparison. And now we're going to talk about when we feel alone. And I believe that all three of those are kind of like dominoes because when we try and measure ourselves against someone else, then we enter into a place of comparison. And when we enter into a place of comparison, I believe a lot of us can pull into this place of of loneliness because we're not the same and we're not measuring up. And so on the inside, on the outside, we look great. We're able to connect. We're able to be in groups. We're able to feel like we have relationships or we can put on a good show. But somewhere deep down in there, there's still like a tinge of of loneliness and and isolation. And I believe they're they're dominoes. So anyway, if you're taking notes, we're just going to jump right into it. Our first note, if you want to write this down, is human beings are hardwired for relationships. We're hardwired for relationships. We are not meant to be alone. And you can find that as soon as you open up your Bible. (laughs) If you've ever tried to read uh, the Bible from beginning to end, you start in the book of Genesis. And in Genesis, it opens with the story of creation. And God doesn't waste any time and talking about how he created the earth and, you know, that all six days he created everything. And within there, he created humankind. And it says he created man, so it was Adam. And then Adam went and he surveyed the whole earth. Adam had the job of the great honor and privilege, actually, of being able to name everything on planet earth. He gave it its name. That's so cool. God bestowed that honor on some dude named Adam. Um, cool. Uh, we have a guy named Adam sitting right there, so... Right on. But so when Adam surveyed the whole, he he went through all the animals, all the things, he got to name them. And then it's when God looked, God said, it is not good for man to be alone. And then that's when he, God put Adam to sleep and then he took, you know, out the rib and then created woman. And then when woman woke up and Adam woke up, Adam looked straight at her and goes, there she is. Uh, but he, this is what he says, it's this bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Because Adam, in it, he didn't know that he was missing something until he found that he was missing something. When he looked and he scanned the whole earth, there was nothing and no one that he could do life with. There was nothing that like resonated with him where he could share uh, some, he couldn't share any part of his life with anything that he was looking at. And then woman appears, God created woman, and there was, when he says, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, he's declaring, that person can have a shared experience with me. I can share my life. We, I can do this together. There's someone who understands me. And so from the very beginning of time, we see that God says, it is not good for, and that, that's just not man, man and woman, but it's mankind. We're, we're created for relationship, to do life together, to share things. And um, I just want to, I think this is kind of funny because as every married person knows, uh, there's there's love and you just can't wait to share your life with that person. But you know, like five years in or maybe one year in or maybe six months in, sometimes it doesn't take that long. <laughs> you realize that you do not perceive all things the same way. 
and you do not enjoy all things the same way. And so we're really excited as young people before we get married to share our life together. It's going to be so good. We're going to watch all the movies together, and we're going to go to all, like, our restaurants are going to be the same. And then you realize, like, you don't want to eat chilies every Friday night. You know, it's not your favorite but someone else does. <laughs> you know, you're not really interested in watching Scarface, but someone else is. <laughs> you know, you come home from work and you can't wait to tell all the stories and nobody cares. <laughs> and so it doesn't take long to feel like I'm not alone technically, but for some reason I feel a little bit lonely. We need people who we can do life with. And in our marriages, there's, there's space for that, and there should be space for that. But then outside of that, there should be other quality relationships and friendships that we have in life that complete that, that kind of circle. And not even in marriages, but just in friendships. You know, I've, I don't look that old. doesn't matter how old I am. But I have... <laughs> I've gone, life has ebbs and flows, seasons, like waves, where, you know, it crests and then it, and then it goes down and, and up and down and up and down. And so throughout our life, we have friendships. Um, and over time, those things change. Like if you got married or you had kids and you had a friend along the way, those seasons of being able to hang out and have sleepovers or to, to go out late and have dinner, like the, the nature of relationships and friendships changes over time. And sometimes when, you, you know, it goes up and then it goes down and it's in that dip and you're like, uh, I don't know. I don't know who I am anymore. I don't know who my friends are. I don't know how I fit in. I don't know how to make that relationship work with this new space in my life. And so it's ebbs and flows, and we have a tendency to pull back. And I think a lot of us, when those kind of things happen, we write off that friendship or we write off that relationship and say, and instead of honoring it for what it is and saying that was a great season of my life and it, it fulfilled a need up until a certain point, a lot of us have a tendency to kind of get yucky and like, oh, I'm not friends with them anymore. Like for some dumb reason, other than the fact that your life just changed. And so we go through these things and I kind of want to talk about that today. What do we do in those times where it's you're up and then you're down and there's that, that time of loneliness? Um, loneliness is often described, described as a sense of isolation or emptiness. Isolation or emptiness. And while everyone feels lonely at times, some of us are a little bit more prone to loneliness or isolation, that feeling, than others of us. Some of us just power through life and it's like you don't even know what that emotion is. <laughs> I don't know how you do that because I've been there. I am very well acquainted with the idea of loneliness and isolation. For some of us, it's triggered by like social isolation. You know, you live in the, the boonies of, of Alaska. I've got a friend who lives in Alaska. We talk every week and they don't see very many people, you know? So that's just you're alone alone and lonely because of where you live uh, on the outskirts of a certain place. And for others of us, it may be the result of experiencing loss or rejection. We lost something, we lost someone, or we were rejected by something or someone. Or, and this is something I struggle with, I'm a pre-rejector. <laughs> I think you're going to reject me, so I reject you first and I never enter in. I won't even get in there <laughs> because I'm afraid that I'm going to get rejected in the first place. Uh, and so um, that's something I've, I've, I had to be honest with myself. And there's a lot of us in the room, I think, who could identify with that, with that sense. So we always feel alone or lonely because there's not really space for anybody to get in there because of, of fear. So if you're reading the book with us, <clears throat> Or you're going to go home today and you're going to read chapter 7, so you're up to speed for your group. Uh, but it opens with, it's, it, and this book is from a pastor in Texas. So these are real people. We know them. Elliot knows them really well. Uh, it opens with a beach day. And he's talking about how his wife loves to go to the beach. And this is totally me and Elliot. When I, when I read chapter 7 and I was looking at the book, I was like, oh, my gosh, I, that's us. I love the beach. Like, take me to the beach, and I'll stay there all stinking day. We're a two-hour drive, though. You know, two, you guys know where we live. We're about two, two-and-a-half-hour drive from the ocean. So when I get to the ocean... That's two and a half hours is enough for me to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plant myself on the beach all stinking day and not leave here. I drove here for this. And I can't tell you how many times our family has driven to the ocean. We've got to the beach and like an hour later, everybody's like, all right, what are we going to do next? Like, this is it. The idea was to go to the ocean. There are no other plans. We are not leaving. Wear your jacket, you know, because it's cold and windy and they're miserable. And I'm like, you knew where we were going. Why didn't you, why didn't you plan better? Uh, and so the, for we've, Ellie and I have had to learn what our shared experiences are. Going to the ocean is not a shared, enjoyable experience. It is death. 
and frustration. And then everybody's hungry, and they're sanding your homemade sandwich. And can I tell you that it doesn't matter how many sandwiches I pack, when we travel, there are never enough sandwiches. Like, all of a sudden, you're 10 times as hungry as you are on any other day of the week. It's the dumbest. <clears throat> you guys know what I'm talking about. Maybe it's not the beach for you, but you have shared experiences, or you think it's going to be amazing, and it just, it just isn't. So we need other quality, really, oh, Elliot and I have learned, uh, we need other quality relationships in our life. Like I need, you know, I've got beach friends. We're going to the beach and we're going to stay there all day because it will kill my husband to do that. And our marriage, you know, like I love him, I honor him. And so, and you know, he wants to play golf. A few times I've driven the golf cart just for fun, but it's, it's more better that he goes and does that alone. So we need... We need other quality relationships in our life as well, not just, not just our husband, not just our wife, or not just, you know, one singular friend. We need, you can write this down, we need quality relationships in order to be healthy and the best version of who we really are. Quality relationships. And I don't, that's not just any relationship. It's quality relationships. And you think of something that's of quality, it's, it's lasting, it's durable, it's made of good material. You know, when you think you buy something authentic on Amazon and you found out it's not, and it doesn't last as long, we need quality relationships. Um, there are more, and you guys, this is, as I step back and think about this, there are more people alive on planet Earth today than there ever have been in the past. Like, there's, a, you know, billions of people on planet Earth today. And there is more opportunity, more ability to be connected. You guys know this. There's more ab- opportunity and ability to be connected with everywhere, anywhere, all the time on the planet because of technology. Yet, and I find this so interesting, instead of be finding ourselves with people, most of the time we find ourselves looking at people. Instead of finding ourselves with people, we find ourselves looking at people. You know, we look at, at people on the television. We look at people on the movie screen. We look at people who are texting because you can see their face in the texting bubble, unless it's just their letter. I've got a Samsung. Okay, so I don't know what you iPhone users see. (laughs) When I'm texting someone, I'll either see the letter T because, you know, I didn't put my picture up for the world to see, or I've got a picture. We look at the texting bubble, or we're on FaceTime with somebody, and we're looking at their face on the screen. We're looking at people instead of finding ourselves with people. And I believe that those are great inventions. I love text messaging. I love... I don't love social media. I love watching movies. I love watching TV. I love talking with my friends. All those things. I think they're great inventions. It's great technology. But this is going to be a little bit much. I think um, that the social networking thing is probably one of the greatest deceptions of our time. Because it gives a pseudo effect of being together with people when instead we're actually just looking at people. And so I think there's, there's, qual- there's benefit to it. But if we, if we use that as a replacement, because there's a very distinct difference in looking at someone and being with someone. There's a very distinct difference in looking at someone and being with someone. God created, and this is why, because God created mankind in his image. And so inside of every person is the divine reflection of the living God. And when people are with people, something divine happens. And it doesn't happen over a screen. You can see it, but it's too far away. When you're with people, something truly divine happens because God has put a piece of him in every single one of us. And so there's transforming power when people come together with people. And I'm not anti-technology. Like I said, I love a good movie. I love, my dad lives out of town, so I love to be able to send videos back and forth and connect that way. But that, that social connection is one of the biggest deceptions of our time because it leaves us empty and isolated. After a time of, and you guys, you guys know this. And so I'm not saying don't do it, but I'm saying we're talking about who am I when I feel alone. And so what I'm asking you to do, it's kind of a big ask, but I'm asking you to kind of reflect on your personal life and ask yourself, how do I feel after I get off of social media or that, that social network and that social technology? How do I feel? Because I think it leaves us empty and isolated. Because what's happening is you're looking at the world, you're looking at people, and you look at, you know, friends or followers. I've got 300 followers or 200 friends on Instagram, but when I get off of there, I don't have anyone to help me with my kids tonight. 
uh, it's Friday night and I really want to go out with somebody and, and hang out or just have a good time with friends and just be together with people. And I'm online and I'm seeing all this stuff. And then I get off and I don't know who I'm going to go to dinner with. I don't know who I can call. I haven't spent any time actually connecting with anybody. I've just been looking at them. And so now I'm alone and I, and I, and I don't know what's happening. Um, I, this is one of my favorites. I'm really, 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 really good. I've got 300 or 500 or 12,000. I don't know how popular you guys are. Uh, followers and friends on, on social media. And I'm so good at commenting. I'm so witty. I've got all the things. But you, you get off of there and you try and enter into a room full of people and you're, you have so much social anxiety and being able to connect with someone face to face. You know what I mean? Like, how, how do you feel when you get off of those things? Guys, and this is, okay, both encouragement and, and some, this is encouragement. You were not designed to have 200 plus friends because there's no way any one person can have quality relationships with that many people. It's impossible. The good news, I want to encourage all of you. If you have two to four people in your life who know your story, if you have two to four people in your life who you can go to about something going on in your life, then you are doing amazing. You're doing amazing. And I want you to hear that, and I want you to believe that, because what happens, again, that huge deception says, I have all these friends out here, but when I get off my phone, when I get off the tablet, when I get off the screen, I feel like I don't have anybody in my life. And if you can think of two to four people who know your story, then that's the truth and that you're not alone. You're not lonely. There are two to four people and you can have quality relationships with that amount of people. And I want to say that because, and I, maybe I'm talking to the wrong crowd, but our young people, they think that's real life. Our young people think unless they're connected with 500 more people who are following them and liking them and commenting, then they're alone and isolated in their life. Do you guys know that the anxiety numbers of our youth are outrageous and off the charts? And so because they feel alone, they take their own life. And that's simply not the truth. The truth is if you have two to four people in your life who know your story and you can go to, then you are doing amazing. I, I need to say that we need to be a little bit more engaged. I think with how 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 we're doing how we're doing life in the midst of technology. I'm kind of I'm pushing that a little hard. I'm I've got much to say, <laughs> but I'm saying that because there's an overwhelming amount of people who struggle with loneliness, and you wouldn't know it by looking at them. You you know across this room, probably half of you have dealt with loneliness, but you wouldn't know it or you wouldn't say it to anybody else because. Because why would you? There, an overwhelming amount of people deal with anxiety and feeling like they're isolated. And that burdens my heart. Because we're, we're a church and we're the body of Christ. And when he puts us together, something divine happens. And so this is God's plan. While we may experience moments of loneliness, because we do live in a fallen, sinful, broken world, we're going to experience moments of loneliness. We're going to experience pain. We're going to experience isolation. God didn't design us to live in that space. His plan for that was spiritual family. And so that's where we're going to get in. Uh, we're going to talk about someone named Ruth in the Bible. So there's a whole Bible book. It's uh, named after her. It's the book of Ruth. You can find it after the book of Judges if you want to go look in, in your paper Bibles for that. It's a really good story. Actually, read Judges first because that book's crazy. Uh, uh, okay, so Ruth, we're going to talk about her. Ruth lived in the time of the Judges. So if you read the book of Judges, you'll find, and I think this is a lot like our world today also, it says that everyone did whatever they thought was best all the time. There was no ruler. There was no king. They weren't living to please the living God. They were so distant from the, from the rules and the commandments uh, of God and his goodness and how he had rescued them and saved them. Like God brought the Moses and the Israelites out of Egypt, out of slavery, and then settled them into the land. When they got settled into the land, generations and generations and generations went by. And what happened is the older generation wasn't telling the younger generation. They would tell the younger generation the story, but not the heart. So the younger generation knew the story, but they didn't know the heart. What they didn't know was how that had transformed the person before them, and that the heart was missing. And so the, now there was just this distant God of rules, but not this God of love that was present with them. So they were doing whatever they wanted all the time. And this is the time where Ruth and Naomi, characters of our story, lived. And the, a famine hit the land. So we're very unfamiliar with the idea of famine. Although we have people leaving California for other reasons. <laughs> okay, so when you think about it, this is what happened. There was a time of famine, and so people were starving to death. 
and they had to figure out what am I going to do to keep on living. If I want to survive, I have to get out of this place and I have to go somewhere else or I have to come face to face with the fact that I'm going to starve to death here. My family members and I are going to starve to death. So Ruth, not Ruth, Naoma, this is where Naoma lives. So it's Naoma and her husband, and then they have two sons. And so they decide as a family, they're going to leave the land of Israel, and they're going to go to the land of the Moabite. So it was a nearby neighboring town, and that's where they're going to go and settle because there's not famine there. So the family leaves, they get up, and they go over there. Now, I don't know about you guys, but there's probably been a time in life where something hard kind of happened, and you, you thought, maybe if I just got up and left and went over here, life would be better. <laughs> if I just relocated, if I replanted, if I tried something new, if I left this and I came over here, everything would be better. It would be a restart. And so that's what happened, although it was desperation. It was starvation that led them to that place. Okay, so they go there, and it's, you know, ah. Oh, God sent me a sign that my decision making was good and great because what happened is when Naomi and her husband and her two sons left the land of Israel and they went to the land of Moab, the two sons found wives and love. So they got married. The two sons got married. And then you know what happened? They died. The husband, so Naomi's husband and the two sons died. I don't know what was happening in their, I don't know in their story, what they were doing, but Ah, uh, they all died. So here's what happens. And again, I, I'm thinking this is hilarious because so often we make choices and we, we, we make decisions and we do things and we think, oh, the Lord is blessing this because good things are happening. And then it was like the rug got pulled out from underneath him. So Naomi moves. They relocate for the famine. They think it's good. They're, they're going to start families. Before any kids are had, the husband and the two sons, they die. So now here's Naomi. And she's going, good Lord, what happened to my life? I left my homeland, and I thought that God was doing something good. And now every single person that I know and love has been taken from me, and I'm st stranded in a land that is not my home. I don't know if you guys have ever found yourself in that place just being a complete idiot, you know? <laughs> like, I'm just going to make, I'm going to make choices, and I'm going to believe that God's going to bless them, and then I'm going to find myself alone. And what, this is interesting. Naomi doesn't turn her back on God. It doesn't say that she does that. But how many of us, if we found ourselves in that situation, would feel lonely and isolated and like, God doesn't love me or care about me because he's not even seeing me. I thought this was him. I thought he was doing good things for me, and then this happened and got taken away from me. So God doesn't even see me. He doesn't even care about me. Um, that's not how this story goes, though. So Naomi is the matriarch now of this family. It's just her. She's a widow. And Ruth and Orpa, Orpha, I don't know how to say her name, are the, the daughters-in-law that married the two sons. Okay, so here's what happens. There's widows. So Naomi's a widow, Ruth is a widow, and Orpa is a widow. And they're standing in the land of the Moabites. And Naomi thinks to herself, if I go back to the land of Israel... I can probably go back and stay with my family. But she's looking at her daughters-in-law going, if I bring them with me, the chances of me getting back with my family are going to be di very difficult because Israel was commanded to care for the orphans and the widows. There was provision within the family line and the government system that would, if they were following the rules, that would provide for Naomi, but not for the foreign women. And so Naomi looks at her two daughters-in-law and says, you guys have to, you guys have to go. Go back to your, the land of your uh, go back to your homes, go back to your families. There's, there's a chance for you. Maybe you'll get remarried. Although, and the two, the two girls knew this was a death wish because in their country, so Israelites, God was going to make provision for orphans and widows. He had said that. But in the land of the Moabites, they didn't care about God. They didn't care about anything. So for them, their, their like pagan culture, for the two daughters-in-law, it was as if they were cursed from the gods. And so it was a death, no matter where they went, it was a death wish for them because they're going to be alone. They're not going to be remarried. And Orpah finally decides to just leave. But Ruth says, no way. No way I'm not leaving. And this is where you guys probably, some of you might have this hanging in your walls. This is where the Hobby Lobby word art gets made famous. And you put it in your house and you think it's so good. This is where it comes from. It's Ruth 1, 16 and 18. Ruth the daughter-in-law who lost her husband says to Naomi, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. 
<clears throat> and then it says, when Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. <laughs> Like, I don't know if you've ever experienced a clingy person, but this person was like clingy. Naomi is saying, go, go back to your home because I'm going to go to Israel and I'm going to go live alone as a widow and I'm just going to live out the rest of my days that way. I'm not going to get remarried. I'm not going to have any more kids. I'm going to go home and hope that like there might be something better. And Ruth is over here like, no, I'm not leaving you. Wherever you go, I'm going. Wherever you die, I'm going to die with you. Ruth is saying, I'm going to give up everything I have to follow you. And Naomi's like, she couldn't do anything about it. Like, she couldn't shake the girl. Ruth, Naomi was like, oh, okay, I guess, like, I, okay, we're going. Uh, and so they go, they go back to the land of Israel. And what I love about this is Naomi really, Naomi probably just wants to give up because she's like, I, I had a husband. We went through a famine. I lost my husband. I lost my kids. And this is what she says to her daughters-in-law. She's like, because the daughters-in-law want to go with Naomi. And Naomi's like, am I going to have more kids? Are you going to wait until my kids grow up so you can marry them? No, go back home. I'm not taking you with me. Naomi wants to get rid of them. Naomi wants to distance herself from the hurt and the heartbreak of that whole season of her life. And Ruth, this crazy daughter-in-law, just won't let go. And so they find themselves back in Israel. And this is what I want to point out. Ruth isn't clinging to anything rational here. The, the Moabite woman, she's not clinging to anything rational here. Because the prudent, calm, rational thing for her to do would have been to mourn the loss of her husband, to mourn that loss, but to go back and stay in her own land, in her own culture, with her own people, where she understands the customs, she understands the cultures, she understands the ins and outs and the nuances of the places where she grew up. Because maybe she can make a new life for herself there. It might be hard, it might be difficult, but that seems like a smarter bet because she'll at least have some control over her own life and over her own destiny. But that's not what she clings to. She clings to Naomi, who's going to go back to a different land with a different God, a different custom, and a different culture. And she's a widow, so she's looked down upon. No matter where she goes, she's looked down upon by people. And so in that broken space, she follows someone to a new land. And so we see, this is what we're seeing. She's not clinging to what makes sense, but who makes sense. And this is, I'm going to give you guys a tip. If you're looking to find spiritual family, that place of connection, you can write this down. Don't cling to what makes sense, but who makes sense. A lot of times we scan our surroundings and we try and figure out what's the next best step. How can I make this work? What puzzle piece can I put together in order to make this work, in order to make my life go well? And what we see, if you're looking for spiritual family and to get out of a place of loneliness and isolation, you're not going to cling to what makes sense. But who makes sense? Because when Ruth met Naomi, something changed forever. I don't, I don't know what it is. Scripture doesn't go into it. But coming into contact with Naomi and her family changed Ruth forever. Ruth moved out of her homeland. She's a widow. She's alone. A natural parting place. Elliot and I are married. If Elliot dies, that's like me clinging to my mother-in-law and and which is fine. I love Cheryl's amazing. I love her. <laughs> I probably would do that. But it's a natural parting place for a relationship to end. And to, to honor that relationship, to cherish it, to say it was good for a season of my life, but then go our separate ways. And Ruth doesn't do that. She clings to the only who that made sense, the only, the only quality relationship that she had in her life. She clung to it. Um, listen to this. Psalm 68, verse 5 and 6 says this. It's talking about God. He's father to the fatherless. He's the defender of widows. This is God, whose dwelling is holy. And that says God places the lonely in families. He sets the prisoners free, and he gives them joy. Now, this psalm was written by King David. You guys know who King David is? Yeah, he's real popular. Okay. To make sure we're all on the same page here, Ruth, the one who clinged to Naomi and left the, her land of the Moabites, is David's great-grandma. Ruth, the crazy lady who, who, who relocated, is David's great-grandma. Now, the rest of the Ruth story goes like this. Ruth and Naomi, they make it back to the land of the Israelites, and Naomi, who wanted to give up, 
I'm using two ladies' names, and I feel like that's really confusing if you don't know the story. Naomi is the older woman who wanted to give up and, and leave Ruth. And what happens is when Ruth decides to follow Naomi, Naomi doesn't give up on her. She instead says, okay, if you're sticking with me, I'm going to find you a family. I'm going to find you a place to belong. I'm going to find you a place. And so she sends Ruth over to this guy's house. His name is Boaz. Anyway, Ruth and Boaz end up getting married. And when they get married, they have kids. The first kid they have, his name is Obed. Okay. And then Obed has Jesse. Jesse is the one who has a whole mess of kids. One of them is David. David becomes the giant slaying, lion defeating, shepherd king of Israel. And this is where it's all going to come together. Israel had a rich history of telling stories. They passed things down from generation to generation to generation, not by writing books, but by telling stories. And David wrote this psalm, Father to the fatherless, defender of widows, this is God whose dwelling is holy. God places the lonely in families. He sets the prisoners free and gives them joy. How many of you guys think that David knew the story of his great-grandma Naomi and his great-grandma Ruth? How many of you guys knew he was acquainted probably with the pain and especially because that story came out of a time of famine for Israel. And so it was a major event in the nation's history. So in the nation's history, people were fleeing their homelands. And so that land was having to be fought for or that land was having to be given to someone else's family or inheritance. And so they were fighting for their inheritance. It was a rich time in their history. And so David, he's, he's a musician, Okay, musician, songwriter, I'll say this, musicians, songwriters, storytellers are very acquainted with the ins and outs of emotion and the depth of what other people feel. And so having heard Naomi's story and having Ruth's story, the story of his great-grandmother and how that came to be, he pens this, father to the fatherless, defender of widows, this is God whose dwelling is holy. God places the lonely in families. He sets the prisoners free and gives them joy. And what I love about this, and David could see this when he wrote it, God set Ruth in a family before she became famous. Ruth is now famous as, as the, the great-grandmother of David, but she became famous when she married some nobody who died, and she was lost and lonely and desperate. That's when God placed her in a family. Ruth's story is born out of scarcity. Her story is, is born out of a time of scarcity. And her story, Ruth's story, gets good because against all odds, she hangs on to the one quality relationship she had. She had one quality relationship. It was a mother-in-law who wanted to leave her behind. And Ruth said, absolutely not. You're the only thing that makes sense right now. And I know I sound crazy. And I know I'm clingy. But this is it. And I'm hanging on to it out of desperation. And out of desperation, God set the lonely in families. He didn't leave Naomi or Ruth alone. And so I want to, you can write this down. Don't overlook the value of divine relationships. Don't overlook the value of divine relationships. The Bible is full of um, other stories. If you think about, there's two prophets. They're named Elijah and Elisha. You can read their story. Elisha uh, is tracking down Elijah going, don't leave me, don't leave me. Give me all the blessing. It doesn't make sense. Elisha had to fight for what he wanted from Elijah. You think about David and Jonathan last week when we were talking about comparison. Uh, if you can go back and listen to that message, it was all about David and Saul. Saul was the king. David was going to be the king. And Saul hated him. He was trying to kill him. Saul has a son named Jonathan. Jonathan and David are best friends. How do you think that went when your dad is trying to kill your best friend? Okay, and so they have to go into hiding. They had to work really hard to keep that relationship alive, and it didn't make any sense. They weren't clinging to what made sense. They were clinging to who made sense because it was good quality relationship. There's another one. If you read the New Testament, there's a story about Paul and Barnabas. Paul is the guy who wrote most of the New Testament. Barnabas had to fight for Paul. The only reason Paul is around is because Barnabas fought for him. Barnabas wasn't fighting for what made sense. But who made sense? Because Paul was a killer. Nobody wanted to be around him. And so this goes both ways. If you're desperate and you're lonely and you're looking for a place, you need to cling to who makes sense, not what makes sense. On the flip side of that, there are others of us who are in a secure place and you can see people 
you can see people who are looking and who God has a plan and a purpose for their life, and it's your job to go fight for them and to bring them in because it's who makes sense. God has, he has put their hand on that person and you can see it and it doesn't make any sense and it's going to be messy and it's meh. You know, you might get text messages in the middle of the night when you'd rather not, but it's who makes sense, not what makes sense because God has a plan and a purpose and he's going to set the lonely in families and he's going to use us to do it. Listen to a few of these scriptures. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. A friend loves at all times and a brother is born for a time of adversity. Another scripture, don't neglect meeting together because we motivate, inspire, and encourage one another. Another one, you are a member of God's family being carefully joined together into his temple. He is building and he has a plan for each member. Now, you guys may have not have picked up, uh, not because you're not smart. I think everybody in the room is so smart, but I think we're also really, really, really good liars, okay? So you may not have picked up on this in life. We're really great at lying to ourselves, but we don't quit when we're in groups, we quit when we're alone. If you feel like you are alone in life, you will quit on whatever it is. But when you're surrounded by a group of people who have quality relationships with you, you will not quit. And this is why, because they won't let you. So you will be exhausted. You will be frustrated. You will be angry. You will want to quit. You will have a backup plan, but the quality relationships in your life will keep you in the place where you're supposed to be. The quality relationships in your life will keep you where you're supposed to be. Um, in our last series, I broke down Psalm 23. If you, you guys can go back and find that too. Psalm 23 is all about the good shepherd. And the biggest takeaway was this, get to the middle of the pack. Because in the middle, the wolf can't pick you off. If you're on the outside, if you're lonely and you're isolated and you've got no quality relationships in your life, that's who the wolf comes looking for. But when you're in the middle, he can't touch you. When you're in the middle, you can still be scared. You can still be nervous. You can still be anxious. You can still feel for your life but you're not going to be taken and you're not going to be separated from the pack because someone else is going to know where you are. So you have to get to the middle. Proverbs 18.1 says this, whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. I, guys, I had to read the scripture like 12,000 times for it to make any sense to me. Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. These are some other ways that scripture is stated. And then I want to break it down and make it really personal. It says, unfriendly people care only about themselves. They lash out at common sense. An unfriendly person pursues selfish ends and against all sound judgments starts quarrels. Another way it said is, he who willfully separates himself from God and man seeks his own desire. He quarrels against all sound wisdom. This is what I want you to listen to. When we experience rejection, isolation, or loneliness, it turns very quickly into a pity party where we make up reasons not to be around people. If you guys are real honest, you'll know you've been in that place. It's a pity party, and we come up with reasons why we don't want to be around people or why people don't want to be around us little lies that seem like they're good good reasons start to pop up and we begin to make agreements with them we begin to think that they're true and so we we farther and farther we turn in in inward and when that happens we experience anger we criticize we become judgmental we become envious we compare ourselves this is my favorite we make up stories in our own mind of why we are unloved and we begin to believe that we like being alone and I'm saying all this because the the topic today is who am I when I feel alone and for for most of us when we feel alone mm, we know how to get out of it but there's others and this is probably who I'm talking to it's the people who say, I know I'm alone, but I don't know how to fix it. I know I'm alone, but I don't believe that scripture that says God's going to set me in a family because I am unloved and people don't like me and people don't want to be around me. And can I tell you that those are lies, all lies from the enemy. And I can say that to you because when I opened up talking today, I said that I, for whatever reason, as a small person, believed that people were going to reject me. 
And so before I could get rejected, I pre-rejected people. I don't know how many times as a younger person or even as a young adult, people would invite me somewhere and I would decide not to go. And you know why I would decide? I would tell them, no, I can't go for this and this and this reason. But the reason why I wouldn't go is because I, I believe they didn't really want me there. I thought they were inviting me because they had to. Or they were inviting me to be polite. But they didn't really want me there. And so there was a lie around my heart they kept me in this barricade of loneliness where I could be in a room full of people but I felt like nobody really knew my story nobody really connected with my heart and it was because I wouldn't let them and so on the outside I seemed like a really nice friendly person but on the inside I was so critical and I was so judgmental and I was so harsh with people And then there was an element, and I'm saying this because I think there are people in the room who could identify with it. There was an element of shame. Because I really wanted, it was like I really wanted to be friends with that person, but I was so critical and judgmental of them that I couldn't because now I'm a fraud. I'm ashamed of the thoughts I've had towards that person, even though I want to be friends with them. I want to be in a relationship with them. I want to connect. I want to belong but I'm so hurt and I'm so broken and I believe so little of myself that I have put you out here and I'm ashamed of that. And so we begin to stay in isolation. We stay in those places of loneliness. We stay in those places of anger. And I love where it says, it's not just that he sets the lonely in families, but he also sets the prisoners free. And it doesn't seem to go hand in hand, but if you're lonely, you're a prisoner of some kind of lie because God doesn't want any of us lonely or in isolation. And so he wants to set you free. Um, I'll just say it again. Father to the fatherless, defender of widows, this is God whose dwelling is holy. God places the lonely in families. He sets the prisoners free, and he gives them joy. And he gives them joy. This is the last blank. We are designed for divine relationships. We feel alone without them. And so I do have one takeaway, and it says, when do you find yourself looking at people and turning inward? Looking at people. So if we're looking at people on social media, we're looking at people through a text message, we're looking at people on the video screen, we're looking at people, and you find yourself turning inward going, I'm not enough, or I don't like them, or I'm becoming critical, or I'm becoming judgmental, and I'm beginning to isolate myself from them because of whatever reason. When you find yourself doing that, ask yourself, instead who can I make plans to get together with who are the two to four people in your life who know your story and who you can open up to about life and decide to make plans with a real person instead of looking at someone and turning inward and then if you're looking to make a change today like today I'm ready to get out of that place I want to start to do something different I would say get in a life group the life groups are up and running and just start there and let me tell you that it's a process you're not just all of a sudden going to be out of loneliness you have to fight for your way out of that you might have to feel like a ridiculous clingy Ruth to get out of that situation. But can I tell you that 10 years later, you'll look back and say, I'm so glad I was that annoying, clingy person who got out of that place of loneliness, and now I've got a story to tell because my God is good. Don't cling to what makes sense, but cling to who makes sense. Let's go ahead and pray. Father God, I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you that you do set the lonely in families, and you are not None of our stories and none of our lives are hidden from you. Father, and as we stop and consider, you know the deepest, darkest depths and places of our hearts. Lord, you know the stories we haven't told yet. You know the places in life where we can't even put our finger on what's happening there, but we know we need help. And you're already there. You're already moving. You're already on the move. You're already making preparations. You already have plans. You already have it lined out. And you're simply asking and saying, son, daughter, I've got you. I know where you are and I'm leading you. Just keep following me one step at a time. God, you are so good and and that is the God we serve. We give you praise for that. If there's anyone in the room today who feels like, I want to give my life to, to that God. There's a God who wants to set me in a family, and I'm not sure I know a ton about him, but I'm really ready to take that next step. If that's you, you can just shoot your hand up into the air, and we'd love to pray with you. It's just coming into the family of God and saying, I see you. Amen. God is so good. If you guys would just go ahead and let's all pray this prayer together. Father God, I thank you for your love. And I thank you for your son. You want me in your family. And you paid the ultimate price for it. I repent of my sin. 
I view you as my Lord. And I give you my life. Fill me with your spirit. And lead me to do what's right. In Jesus' name, amen.